so much, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to be at the event. I was just as while we were getting ready, I was talking about the first event I I went to for All Things Open was a, an earlier kind of incarnation of it that uh, was held at Clemson University in South Carolina ten years ago or a little over ten years ago. When I just listened to Chris Debona's. Uh, um, keynote and I was reminded of uh, a lot of the a lot of my ideas on kind of the cultural foundation of open source and the the notion of uh, project-based innovation um, and uh, you know some of those ideas came out of earliest discussions with Chris uh, and listening to presentations like that so anyway it's a pleasure to be here I'll uh, I'll walk through a series of uh, of slides and talk about um, really how these, these parallels exist in how over the last uh, 12 and a half years of doing this at OIN, running OIN, uh, we've gone from 31 licensees to now 3,300 licensees uh, and how the community has grown, but really on the back of this notion of project-based innovation and how more and more people are getting together in different technology areas and sectors to be able to create new novelty, to innovate in ways that would otherwise not be possible. Um, and uh, it's really, a, you know, over, over time, I've come to understand the, the power of this social movement. Uh, and that's where this the modality of how we collaborate and one plus one plus one doesn't equal three, it equals six or 10 or 20. When we bring smart people who are working together, uh, cross race, cross religion, cross uh, national boundaries. Uh, there is no way to to really turn off this social movement once it's started. And, you know, it's one of those things that I think even from my conversations with uh, Richard Stallman over the years that I don't think Richard had any any expectation that uh, that this social component would be so powerful and create the, the, the sustainability of open source. I mean, obviously openness is, is his thing and under, he understood the power of that from the beginning, but not, the so, not that it was really a social movement that he was ushering in that would have such broad scale effect on how technology is developed and how we, how we work and, and educate and learn and, and participate. Um, and so it's, a, as I said, a pleasure to be here and uh, uh, the one thing that a lot of people, a lot of audiences that I speak to, and I don't think this one necessarily, but people uh, often misunderstand how uh, uh, widespread uh, open source is and how pretty much every electronic touch we have uh, is enabled by open source. And many people think if they use an iOS device that they're, uh, that they're somehow uh, walled off from the open source community. but in point of fact that the foundation of, uh, of iOS is really built on, on lots of open source code. It may not be built on the kernel, but uh, it's replete with open source code when you look at what's inside it. And clearly every exchange uh, that we have in the, in the world where stocks are traded, commodities are traded, the cloud. Uh, uh, Chris was just talking about the proliferation of uh, uh, of, uh, of Android. Chrome is also uh, very broad based uh, as really the realization of, uh, of the whole notion of, uh, of thin client, which was talked a lot about in the 90s and then ultimately made possible um, through, uh, through the, the, uh, the, the sale and distribution of, low, of affordable uh, web browsing devices like Chrome. Uh, and so the, uh, the the, the way that we um, invent is one of the key kind of elements of the social movement. And, you know, we're collaborating all the time to be able to create something we couldn't create in siloed organizations. And so um, at probably it was 11 and a half, 12 years ago uh, that I met with uh, Jim Zemlin and had dinner with him in San Francisco. And I remember him talking to me about wanting to, uh, to do something that was embraceable by uh, all manner of companies, but particularly getting more uh, medium to large size companies to participate in open source and to not be fear, not fear 
um, patent risk or other associated risks associated with the use of, uh, uh, of uh, open source code. And, uh, and he talked about licenses and he talked about the, the, the notion of moving away from GPLv3 and moving to permissive licenses. Apache is the most common license that they use, but they also use other permissive licenses. And uh, a lot of those licenses, unlike GPLv3, have very uh, modest patent protection components to them. Uh, and as a result, the uh, OIN's uh, uh, importance became more, uh, more of a point of focus uh, because if you are gonna utilize open source code and you're gonna collaborate on a technical basis, uh, you're going to share ideas, share code, build on each other's ideas and create this higher levels of innovation that result. And you're going to do so that's in, in an environment that creates inclusivity uh, and embraces diversity in order to, to distill the collective intelligence, the, the finest grains of value uh, that, that drive open source innovation uh, and software innovation in general, then you're going to have to... Uh, uh, figure out a way to uh, uh, have these projects be supported so that people can feel comfortable utilizing them. And so the OIN model is something that existed when he made this decision, but um, we have lived in the slipstream of uh, uh, and encourage legal collaboration uh, in the same manner as technical collaboration occurs since that time uh, and having people recognize that when technical leads from a particular project share uh, releases, those releases create the foundations of, of adoption. And uh, in order to make those companies feel comfortable, OIN includes those, that core code in, the, in what we call Linux system definition, which is essentially a, a foundational element of that creates the scope of the cross license that we uh, we are involved in and so we look at all these projects uh, you know this is just a handful of, of projects that come from uh, from the Linux Foundation but I could look at uh, Mike Belinovich's projects I could look at the, the Apache projects and many and, and literally thousands of other projects and say yeah these are important projects in these technology areas whether it's security mobility network management network operation network network security uh, uh hyperledger uh uh you know obviously automotive grade linux uh, iot there's so many different uh projects out there that support emerging technologies in key key sectors and so with this notion uh, of co-opetition, this goes back really to the 90s when uh, uh, mathematicians started invading the province of business school and started talking about game theory and the notion that we need to collaborate more in order to more effectively compete. And really when I first looked at open source you know, 12, 15 years ago, uh, 20 years ago even, you know, I was looking at it and thinking, this seems to really be almost a realization or a manifest destiny of what what those mathematicians were talking about when they when they introduced the notion of game theory in business context uh, the idea that that we we have this this uh, this value that we can get but we can't get there alone uh, we need to be doing it as part of a community and projects create community where people collaborate where they they think of things that they wouldn't have naturally thought of and they feel this this uh, this exhilaration, this endorphin high of being able to to add something to some what someone else has created to be able to grow something larger than they could have grown on their own. And I, I think this this parallelism is always with me, uh, even as I think I talk to companies that you know. Uh, Huawei just joined our community a few months ago, and you know Huawei has seventy-eight thousand patents. Canon is part of our community, eighty-three thousand patents. I mean, you go from this this you know open source collaborative environment where people aren't thinking about things like patents; they're just thinking about elegant code and and how you how you grow that elegant code through collaboration. And then on the other side of it, you've got you know, people on the legal front that are that are looking at the traditional ways of in 
of inventing and protection and innovation through, through it, the, the codification of ideas. And that codification of ideas has is, is been around for you know, well over 100 years uh, to protect some of the most significant innovations in history. But uh, you know, I think what open source is, is, is forced upon the people who do the codification on the, the mindset of those who actually are the inventors is the notion that, that with open source and open collaboration and this idea of co-opetition, we are uh, collaborating uh, to be able to, in, in many different areas, uh, and in those areas where we collaborate and rely on each other, uh, to be able to build on each other's ideas and create this, this higher sense of innovation and novelty and inventiveness, we need to recognize that uh, we also, uh, um, uh, um, you know, are, are looking at if we're really going to be wide open, so to speak, and, and all in to the collaboration activity, we need to recognize that where we collaborate, we shouldn't be suing each other because we need to feel comfort in adopting that code and utilizing it in whatever manner we choose, as long as we're in compliance with the license under which the code was developed. And so when that, uh, when that reality has, has hit, many different industries have kind of, kind of come to open in a different way and different time frame. Uh, and you look at the telecom and electronics industry, and they've been working and open for a lot longer. They're a lot more software dependent historically. But you look at you know heavy machinery companies like Kubota, uh, you know tractor companies like John Deere. All these companies are moving toward uh, more the integration of more open, more software, and and as a result, more open source software. All these companies. Uh, that are working in this area, whether it's power, energy, uh, uh, automobiles, uh, 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 machine aut automation, all these companies are coming to open source uh, in their own time, their own pace. But what is a common element of their intellectual property function uh, in these companies is a realization that the world that was is no longer. And now we have to kind of recognize there's a there's a form of duality that we have to understand that's critical to the accommodation of this source of incredible innovation that comes from open source. And so uh, the IP, a lot of the, the work that I do is in, is in socializing, educating, and acculturating uh, intellectual property department leads uh, and inventors at, at various companies around the world in many different sectors uh, to have them understand that that this isn't the end necessarily if they don't want it to be. Many of the companies in our community uh, reject the idea of software patents. That's you know that's their view, and 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 they can maintain that and support uh, uh, actions to be able to ensure that, like Europe, that uh, my, uh, the Euro Euro European Patent Office, that it's very very difficult to get uh, software patents granted. Um, in the U.S., China, Japan, Korea, very different, uh, different environments uh, and different approaches. But nonetheless, co from companies who are extremely pro-patent to companies that are uh, extremely anti-patent, um, we have created community around the common notion that that where we collaborate, we shouldn't sue each other because we need to feel comfort in adopting this this incredibly important code. There are, there are a number of a number of programs that support patent non-aggression that OIN has given rise to. OIN was formed 15 uh, years ago, and then these other organizations to be able to deal with patent assertion entities or patent trolls, uh, to be able to deal with poor quality patents, to deal with the notion of privateering so that if somebody sells patents, you're protected like Lot Network protects you. Uh, there are many different programs that, that OIN success has given rise to, which, which is, is heartening to see because what OIN is focused on first and foremost is reducing risk in the community and allowing companies to make choices uh, because of objective uh, technical uh, assessments 
rather than because of being forced into utilizing proprietary over open uh, because of uh, being held up by, by a, a patent holder uh, that doesn't get the notion that I just described. I mean, OIN was formed, um, I think it's no, no secret, uh, to deal with a one particularly acute monolithic threat represented by Microsoft uh, 15, 16, 18, 20 years ago. Uh, largely built on rhetoric, but also built on some litigation uh, and licensing and uh, aggressive licensing at the time. And uh, that world has changed, as uh, we all understand. Uh, the inevitability of open source is something that I always talk to Microsoft about uh, when they were at their most hardened uh, state of, uh, of opposition uh, to, uh, to open source uh, 12, 13 years ago. When I started doing this, and uh, uh, and it it's always struck me that this was something that they would have to embrace if they wanted to be able to grow their business in the direction that that they were then very very early days thinking about, but not actually actualizing. And so OIN was formed with a in a, in a context of aggression, of 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 passionate rhetoric, uh, and uh, and. Uh, by Microsoft and, and ultimately by some other companies that were living in the shadow of open source, maybe partaking of open source, but, but only as, as users and not contributing back. And so not really understanding the cultural imperatives of open source. And so uh, in 05, it was formed, uh, funded by IBM, Red Hat, uh, Novell at the time, Sony, NEC, and Philips, uh, Google and Toyota uh, joined later because of because those are these are companies that are leaders. Uh, Google and Toyota um, recognize that uh, uh, that Android and uh, Google in particular recognize that Android and uh, and Chrome uh, needed leadership, needed someone to step out. To it's not enough just to curate uh, these these incredibly innovative platforms for uh, computing and and mobile communications, uh, but they also needed to have a, a have a stake and have a role in ensuring that uh, that the technology, the core technology that drives these platforms, was protected, uh, whether it be the Dalvik engine or otherwise. Uh, Toyota recognized that it was they were too even though they're the, they were and are the most significant uh, and largest uh, uh, car maker in the world that. Uh, they were being dis disintermediated by a, uh, as uh, Jim Zemlin likes to talk about, by a, uh, a smartphone and a piece of Velcro. And, uh, and th that they have to be more in the future than just metal bending. Uh, and they had to take control and re really reemerge as technology companies, uh, not, not, not relying completely on tier one suppliers, but, but being a technology company themselves. And I think it's interesting to see, you know, how, again, this, this transition has occurred um, from when I came into OIN, that 31 licensees I mentioned, to now 3,300 and, and counting, and companies all around the world. Uh, back then, uh, you know, you had very little open source activity uh, in China, uh, practically none. Uh, Korea had some. Uh, but it was young, and Japan was the the mature player in uh, in open source with maybe uh, five or five four or five years of uh, of experience utilizing and experimenting with open source. Uh, and so the, the the real growth over the last uh, the last in particularly five to seven years in Asia and in China in particular uh, is really heartening to show that it's one world. <clears throat> where all all software is being developed collaboratively uh, through this model, all of the uh, all of the open source contributors and participants. Uh, so again, some of the most significant holders of patents in the world, but also the companies recognizing the importance of software to their business and buying into this notion that uh, that there's a zone through around which we should uh, feel comfort in terms of adoption of, of, of open source code. Outside of that zone, uh, what people do based on their own, their own strategy, their own plan and approach is something different. But in the core of Linux and open source, all of the core code that comes out of these many, many, many different projects, this needs to be protected.
and we need to feel comfort in adoption. Uh, OAN is very much global. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of is the fact that we have expanded so significantly in, uh, in Latin America, but more importantly in Asia. Uh, and we, uh, we are by design global uh, and we have people that work with us and for us all around the world. Uh, in fact, the majority of people are not American that uh, work inside OIN. Um, and this is an important sub-element to show that 18% of our licensees are really in the community that we built is really in, uh, in Latin America, uh, Asia Pacific, you know, 23% and, uh, and North America and Europe. <clears throat> Um, this is just a representative sample of the kinds of companies that are in our community. Some of the most significant companies in their space, clearly automotive has blown up in terms of their adoption of open source code, uh, whether it be Android for Auto, whether it be uh, uh, the uh, automotive grade Linux project. Uh, there are many, many companies now that are, are recognizing the uh, from the auto sector that are recognizing the importance of open source in order to allow them to reemerge as as Toyota has as a technology centric company and a technology leader. You know, I think you look at Daimler; <clears throat> they are uh, in Europe one of the most uh, you know kind of long standing innovators, and it's nice to see them adopting open source code and creating partnerships with companies that can help drive them to the next the next generation. Uh, of vehicles, um, and uh, you see, you know, Volvo and the Geely relationship uh, has been very successful. Renault, uh, you know, it's SAIC, some of the largest car makers in the world, uh, and then you have all manner of uh, fintech companies. Uh, Sumitomo Mitsui Bank Corporation uh, is one of the largest banks in the world from Japan. Uh, it's a hyperbank. Uh, you have Ant Financial, which is now Ant Group. Uh, the largest uh, transactor of mobile mobile payments in the world on a daily basis, Tencent, which is the second largest, utilizing WeChat Pay, and then Union Pay, which clears every one of those transactions. These are just billions of transactions a day uh, that take place on mobile devices uh, in and in uh, uh, in China, and uh, and you know we expect that more and more companies from that sector, uh, traditional banks. Uh, uh, will will also be participated again because of the inevitability and the importance of open source. The scope of the cross license, it's kind of important to understand how this all kind of transpires, but uh, we look at, uh, you know, major project management organizations, whether it's Eclipse, Apache, OpenStack, which now has, has morphed into, uh, it's, it has now another name, uh, I think in the last couple of weeks, uh, and uh, Linux Foundation, obviously. So Open Atom is, uh, is a new foundation that uh, has been formed in China. And there are a half dozen projects from some of the most Baidu, Ali, Tencent, uh, 360, uh, Huawei uh, are all supporting uh, an initial set of projects there. Uh, and all of these project management organizations, we look at at how they're, they're collaborating technically, where the important projects are, the ones that they think are most important. And then we look at, at basically bringing companies together to, to enter into a legal compact. Uh, the companies that participate in those projects that are, that are under these foundations that are most important, most central to the future of open source code, we bring them together and, and, and allow them to inform our perspective on what's most important uh, in terms of the code that they are, they're, they're relying on and building on and what's truly core. Um, and then that core code becomes something that we evaluate for inclusion in the Linux system definition, which is the scope of the cross license that everybody agrees they're, they're when this cross license, this cross license essentially says that where we collaborate, we're not going to sue each other, as I described earlier. And specifically, if you have patents that read on this, that read on functionality that's inside the core of this Linux system definition, you pledge to cross license your patents to everyone else in the community, uh, and you pledge not to sue on core Linux functionality. Uh, it's a pretty basic concept. 
again, that that is embraced by the most patent centric to uh, to the other end of the spectrum of companies that are antagonistic toward the whole notion of software patenting. Um, and so we've created community around the idea of collaboration uh, in the core being central and the avoidance of of uh, uh, of, uh, of litigation and, uh, and aggressive licensing programs that would slow or stall the progress of Linux and discourage adoption. We have a technical committee made up of the members of the original members and, and the, the, the additional founding members, Google and Toyota. And we also have a technical advisory council made up of 12 members from all around the world who are incredibly software centric and complementary to our, our, our uh, core members, uh, funding members of OIN. So we look at kind of the evolution of key projects and we, you know, obviously Linux is the most prolific of all projects in the open source world, but we look at Android, Chrome, uh, OpenStack, we have packages from all of these projects, uh, Kubernetes, uh, Docker, uh, Hadoop, uh, we're just adding Hadoop, uh, and Kafka and uh, so many more project, uh, so many more elements of project code and functionality are being included. The major networking projects, OP ONAP, OPNFV, Hyperledger, which is blockchain code uh, that's being used by many, many companies now, uh, not just banks, uh, uh, financial services industry, but across industry. Um, so the scope of the cross license is very broad, um, but it's really focused on uh, there it comes from many different sources, but always focus on the core. Um, lots of common base packages because they're reused so frequently. Uh, there's incredible reuse, as everyone you know in in this audience would know. Um, and enterprise is where where a lot of a lot of Linux our focus started because a lot of Linux penetration was most significant there. And, uh, and so it's evolved over time as Linux is and open source have grown. Uh, and, uh, and essentially for us, it's the, the license is really a way of getting to uh, building community. Uh, companies that have a common set of values and norms around how you use patents in an increasingly open source centric world. Uh, in the beginning, it's, uh, it's a little bit, uh, off-putting for IP-centric, uh, patent-centric organizations that uh, that put a toe in the water in open source. But over time, they see that that mastering the licenses on the copyright side that the projects are done under, that you're drawing code from, is an inc impor incredibly important element. And there are many different tools that help people do this, as well as the open chain project, which is creating a set of, of norms and, and a, a set of standards as to how one uh, complies to ensure that compliance is maintained and is top of mind for anyone who adopts open source code. And then on the other side of it, on the patent side, OIN is establishing a, again, a set of norms. Um, and, and this community is really about opportunity and obligation. Uh, that's what open source is about, where we have this great opportunity to adopt code and to utilize it, integrate it, build on top of it. Um, but we have obligations um, as well. And, uh, and it's this, this wonderfully elegant self-organizing kind of component of open source that allows this new novelty and innovation to come about in a very organic way. But then there's also the self-regulation. And uh, you know, you look at the Software Freedom Conservancy, uh, uh, Harold Velta in Europe. The, these are entities that focus on on helping companies uh, maintain compliance, how, helping individuals uh, understand when they're utilizing this code in a particular particular activity or product that they're developing. Uh, what the obligations are, what the expectations are of this community. And I think this is one of the things that's, that's constantly evolving is the, this recognition of obligation. But I think it's incredibly important because it's central to the social fabric of, of what open source is about. And it's exciting when you see companies move from, from kind of that trepidation uh, to, to maturity and start to understand how to manage risk uh, associated with the use of open source code and how that risk is really 
uh, not significant at all because of organizations like OIN and and uh, uh, and other organizations that are out there designed to uh, to provide help and assistance in making sure under individual companies understand how to comply, how to work with other companies in their sector uh, effectively, how to collaborate. Um, it's a it's in the beginning it's a little bit of a leap of faith, but over time we see more and more. Uh, this movement to uh, to uh, uh, understanding of of what the expectations are, and that's quite frankly why this the growth of open of of open source has occurred is the access to great technology and the ability to participate in the development of it, um, but also the, the the OIN community as again in the slipstream of open source projects. As the open source projects have grown, we've grown because the importance of open source has spread from sector to, to sector, industry to industry. Essentially, people join OIN because it's about patent risk mitigation. Um, we're safeguarding the members from patent risk. Everything we do is free. That's another important component of this. Um, there's no, no analog in the history of technology or patenting or patent pools or cross licenses to OIN. Uh, I mean, IBM ha and, and Red Hat and the founders of OIN deserve a tremendous amount of credit because they signed the same license as everybody else because they have to because it's a pro-competitive platform. Um, and it's very important that it's a pro-competitive platform. Um, and so they, they put in tens of millions of dollars into supporting the administration and operation. I mean, we also have, we own 1300 patents and applications. We spent a hundred million dollars buying those patents. We make those available on a royalty free basis to everyone. Uh, with those patents, we've done a lot of clearance in front of major open source projects. We also have uh, uh, owned patents because we wanted to have a way of counteracting uh, the negative effects of, of litigation from uh, from companies like Microsoft in the beginning, uh, but you know, as as many of you, if not all of you, understand, Microsoft became a participant of our community uh, to just about two years ago, and that's uh, you know an incredibly important development uh, for us because it's a a. Uh, recognition by Microsoft of the importance of community, the importance of the, the values that OIN represents, and the and the cross license that it uh, that it promulgates and grows. And we work very closely uh, with Microsoft now, as a matter of fact. And we partnered with them and IBM uh, and Linux Foundation to uh, to fund a um, an anti troll mechanism. Uh, it's a, an entity that uh, called Unified Patents, which uh, attacks um, and uh, and gets um, uh, a the uh, the invalidation of patents that should have never been granted in the first place that have some element of focus on uh, on open source. And so we founded together the open source zone inside Unified Patents so that they can uh, look at patents held by non-practicing entities and uh, file what are called IPRs against them to have this invalidation occur so that the patents can't be used to, uh, uh, to attack uh, companies that are adopting uh, uh, and utilizing uh, Linux and, and, uh, and other open source code. And so that's an important initiative, but the symbolic nature of bringing IBM and uh, Microsoft together uh, was very important to me uh, to be able to kind of validate that Microsoft is doing what it can in the in the in the best way possible as a citizen of this community, uh, and it may have been uh, slow on the on the the uptake, but it is, it is a fast follower and uh, and a a company that we know we can rely on to support this uh, legal collaboration that reduces risk. And so we're very happy with the partnership and the rela and that's just one manifestation of how we're working together with them. Um, Again, because it has no monetary cost, it's something that people look at and they go, well, how can that be? And, you know, you have $100 million worth of patents that you're making available on a royalty free basis to us. Uh, you have this massive cross license where 3 million patents are owned by the companies that are part of the community. And uh, all of them are exposed to the cross license based on the scope and how it expands. Um, they, 
all manner of companies that that want to feel comfortable adopting open source code. It's almost gotten to the point where if you don't, if you're utilizing open source code and you don't adopt uh, uh, the OAN license, you don't become a licensee and participate in the community and the cross license, then it's almost some for it's uh, really is a form of prima facie negligence where you you're being negligent and exposing your your the technology that you've adopted from the open source projects that you you uh, work in uh, to uh, to patent risk and so um, it's also become a se a sense of and this is one of the things that that was played back to be my by Microsoft I mean they're obviously very they want to hire the best people in the world and the, the best coders in the world. And the, and coders are, are very uh, politically sensitive, uh, politically aware, legally aware. It's a very interesting community uh, because of the awareness and the knowledge of, of coders. Um, and one thing that's not lost on them is the sense of uh, how do you behave? What is, what is, what is your, what is your, how do you participate in this community? Are you authentic or are you not authentic? And the, the goal of being authentic and being able to hire against Google and, and, and Facebook and, uh, and uh, all the other companies, uh, Amazon, all the other companies that are active in their markets where they want to hire, um, they wanted to, you know, show it, send out a message. Um, you know, GitHub was a message and an important investment for them. I think OIN is an equally important uh, um, uh, investment for them in terms of committing their patent portfolio to the cross license <clears throat> and the um, and the the nature of what they've done is really shows that they're this this idea of authenticity is one that they're very much committed to. Uh, they want to be authentic, and and I and you know I'm gratified that that what we've done and been working on in terms of building community through the license over and expanding the license to cover important code, that those actions are appreciated uh, by what was the the most significant uh, uh, antagonist to uh, to Linux and open source uh, just uh, 10, 10 years ago, and so. That idea of authenticity is another reason why people want to join OIN. In fact, we did a survey not long ago of, uh, of the 250 largest patent holding companies in our community uh, and asked them why they participate in OIN. Is it the cross license? Is it access to our patents that we own? Uh, is it this notion of authenticity, the whole notion of, of community that they wanted? This is what you do when you're when you're when you're joining the open source world and you're joining projects and taking code and utilizing it. Um, that it's it's who you are, and it was actually the this last point. Uh, as we've done these surveys now, two over the last four years, we see an, an, a trend that seems to be appearing where companies uh, recognize how important this, this is and how important being authentic in the community is uh, to being a good citizen of the community. And so, uh, you know, again, I'm gratified by that because it's, uh, it's what I've always seen from the beginning, um, that companies again that they rec they have to recognize the obligation and OIN is be is becoming an obligation and a, and a litmus test for authenticity uh, for for many many companies in the community and so at the end of the day the only companies that are not joining the joining OIN that are where their companies actually are committed to open source uh, are companies that want to reserve the right to sue on core Linux and open source functionality and and that list is is shrinking every day, fortunately, as we bring more and educate as we're educating more and more companies and bringing them into the community. And so, uh, I, again, I appreciate the opportunity to be be here. Uh, and uh, from the ten years ago when I first spoke at at, uh, at, uh, at one of Todd's events to today, uh, it's uh, it's great to see the growth of this of this community. Uh, now, you know, having a home in uh, Research Triangle Park uh, and now a virtual home uh, temporarily as we deal with COVID. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a testament to how, how um, authenticity in this world is also important uh, because the people who run this and the people I've been associated with over the years speaking at it 
are, are, pe are the kind of people who are the foundation of the open source community. And it's nice to see when they're running events and, uh, and, it, and such a sense of community is in evidence, uh, whether virtually or in person. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kit. Uh, it was really an interesting talk. I thoroughly enjoyed, and I hope all other participants. Uh, so if, if anyone of you have any questions, we can stay here for a couple of more minutes. If not, then I actually have a quick question. <laughs> Um, I'm a PhD student at NC State. I was thinking how should I really think about uh, considering academic research in the ecosystem of OIM or in the open source, in the open source ecosystem specifically? Uh, what is your, what is your PhD in? Uh, computer science. I'm doing my AI and machine learning for some of this very specific module-based uh, model -based machine learning. Okay, well, I think one of the things is having the right mindset approaching uh, participation in a career in computer science and, you know, an open source is, as I said, it, there's a permanence. This isn't about, it's, an, it's not, and it's, it would never will be about disintermediating one player and doing a workaround and creating an alternative technology that gets adopted. Open source isn't about the tech. It, it, the byproduct of the activity is, is technology, but its main purpose is to be able to create and stimulate new ideas where that were not conceivable by one individual or not as it could not be as elegant if they were not built on. And I'd say um, the, understanding the social um, requirements of participation in the community and always having that top of mind. The benefits that we get out of this, this is, this is the, the, you know, kind of the quietest revolution, but it is in fact a revolution. I, I'm in China all the time normally. Um, I travel typically 270 to 300 days a year and I'm constantly on the road in China seven or eight times. And I, I, I have to kind of be somewhat amused by, it doesn't matter what the, the regime is, whether it's our flavor of uh, democracy, Par you, France's flavor of, democ of, of social democracy, uh, whether it's a communist country that has an incredibly active capitalist uh, driven economy. Um, everyone, as long as you have networks and the opportunity to participate is con contributing, collaborating and working together, irrespective of whether, you know, Donald Trump doesn't get along with uh, so-and-so in another country and they have a battle or their trade wars or trade issues, we're all collaborating. And, and there are ways of dealing with things. You look at the, the movement of, uh, of projects. Um, uh, Mike Malinovich is uh, Project uh, Eclipse is now based in, in Brussels. Um, you know, we are, through policies, we're creating environments in that, that we work in um, that, that are less favorable or more, more appealing or less appealing than others. And I think it's, it's important to recognize that no matter where we decide to live, we have the ability to collaborate and we don't have to, the, the, the historically, you know, I think it was, it's incredibly debilitating on families to have to relocate. You know, you get, you're in North Carolina, but, uh, you know, if I think of the 90s, we had this mass exodus from Europe, from, from India, from China, from uh, even Japan, Korea, people coming to Route 128 or even to RTP or to go to, uh, to Silicon Valley where they could get access to capital, talent, and, and, and resource to be able to support their, their business ideas. Now I think we can, we can invent more in situ where we are. Uh, we're not having to relocate, dislocate uh, from our families to be able to kind of access this open source world. And I think that's an important thing because quality of life, as we think about it now, is, it's just too important um, for us to 
uh, to make sacrifices that that will will engender regret uh, or create uh, social division. I think what we want is to be able to be unified uh, wherever we are and and make good choices about where we are and where we work, where we live. Uh, and it's and it's not only the location of where we decide to live, but it's who we work with. And I think one of the points that Chris made in his his presentation earlier, his keynote, is is incredibly true. It's something I found to be true on my you know on my own exploration and experience. There's such good people in open source. They're people who who recognize that the benefit of of listening, of understanding, of collaboration. And that's one thing that I would look at in my career if I were you, and that I really wanna have is uh, the ability to make choices about how and what I work on, uh, the ability to be appreciated, not just by the, per the company I work for, but by the community in which I work, the project community, and recognize that the freedom uh, of being able to do these things is incredibly powerful and enabling. Um, and also just, you know, when you think about the kind of life that you want to have, um, you know, working in open source to me is, is something that, that is very accretive to being able to create quality of experience and the ability to, to be a lifelong learner and for people to recognize that leadership is not what we should be looking for, but we should be looking for learnership. People who are lifelong learners who can then can contribute back in ways that 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 traditional management theory doesn't understand. Yeah, absolutely, I agree, agree with that. Yeah, and it is quite insightful. Uh, uh, thank you once again to be part of ATO. Oh, it's my pleasure, and uh, and to anyone who attended, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, and guys coming on now. So uh, we'll uh, we'll say goodbye. Take care.